Good evening, everybody here in Pew Hall, and uh, good evening to everyone uh, who's uh, coming from who knows where uh, to join us in this event this evening. Uh, I'm really happy to uh, uh, to host this flash uh, symposium on Chat GPT, and we have a great panel, so I want to get right to that as soon as possible. Uh, I just want to introduce uh, the topic a little bit here in about three minutes. Uh, basically, I was going to actually have ChatGPT live here and talking to us, but I decided I'm not stupid enough to try that because if you've tried it recently, you know you log in and it's not available. So, uh, so I actually went ahead and recorded a conversation I had, so I'm going to simulate that conversation if that's okay with you tonight. Uh, <clears throat> so first off, uh, I want to ask... Uh, Chat GPT, can I call you Chatty? And so, you know, because Chat GPT is really not a great, a great name, so I just. You may call me Chatty, or simply by using OpenAI or AI. Thanks, Chatty. <laughs> Thanks, Chatty. That was great. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, I appreciate your being here tonight. You're welcome. I am here to help, so please don't hesitate to ask me anything. Okay, so let's test your knowledge this evening. Chatty, if I could. Who is the dean of class at UF? Thinking, thinking. Okay. I'm sorry, but I don't have the current information on who the dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at the University of Florida is, as my training data only goes up until 2021 and it's possible that there is a person by that name who is not well known or notable enough to be widely recognized. I would recommend checking the university's official website for the most up-to-date information. Okay, so we've identified one limitation of chat GPT. So I'm actually Chatty, the Dean of uh, Class at UF. Uh, how about this, can you describe the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences? Certainly. The College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, CLAS, at the University of Florida is the largest college within the university and is dedicated to providing a comprehensive education in the arts and sciences. CLAS offers a wide range of undergraduate and graduate programs in areas such as humanities, natural sciences, social sciences, and mathematics. Well, that's great, Chatty. You're on a roll right now. Uh, let's try another one uh, before we introduce the panel. Uh, let's try this. Uh, we're in Pew Hall, a great building, uh, relatively new building here on campus. Uh, tell us about Pew Hall. Pew Hall is a dormitory located on the campus of the University of Florida. It is a part of the University of Florida's Department of Housing and Residence Education and was built in 1947. Ooh. Pew Hall offers traditional style dormitory living with communal bathrooms and is home to mostly first year students. The dormitory features a mix of double and triple occupancy rooms and has a capacity of approximately 551 students. Okay. I think we've learned something about you tonight, Chatty. Uh, <clears throat> you have a great imagination. But uh, Pew Hall is not a dormitory. You know, what do you have to say about I that? I apologize for the mistake in my previous response. Pew Hall at the University of Florida is not a dormitory and does not have resident rooms. Thank you for bringing this to my attention, and I will make sure to provide accurate information in the future. Okay, thanks. So, Chatty, uh, one last thing. You know, you're trained on a lot of information. Just tell the audience uh, here this evening what you were trained on, what, how you were trained. I was trained on a diverse range of internet text, including websites, books, and other forms of written communication, totaling billions of words. The data was sourced from a wide range of topics and was filtered to remove low quality or offensive content. This large training set allows me to generate text and answer questions on a wide range of topics, but my responses are not always perfect and may contain inaccuracies. You can say that. Uh, so, thanks for being honest, Chatty. Uh, one last task for you before we turn it over to the panel. I'd like for you to introduce the moderator, Jane Southworth, uh, who's going to be running the panel this evening. Certainly. It is my pleasure to introduce Jane Southworth, 
the moderator for tonight's panel. As the moderator, Jane will be guiding the discussion and ensuring that the panel stays on track and addresses the key issues and questions related to the topic. With her expertise, she is well equipped to lead a productive and insightful conversation, and I'm sure that she will do an excellent job. Let's all give her a warm welcome. It's also good to know I'm so inconsequential uh, that it also doesn't know who I am at the University of Florida. So I am Dr. Jane Southworth and I am the chair in the Department of Geography. And for the last 18 months, I've also been leading the AI across the curriculum initiative uh, for the quality enhancement plan for the University of Florida that will start in 2025. So I do a lot of things with AI. And since my son discovered this, he's at um, since my son discovered the wonders of uh, ChatGPT, we have had a lot of fun, as I'm sure many of you have, in playing with it and seeing what it can and cannot do. Uh, obviously, that is a lot of fun and it's a, a great and new tool, but it clearly has some serious issues when we think about it in terms of education, be it lower school, middle school, high school, and certainly universities. So we thought, it would be a fun and engaging task to think about some of those issues. And to do so, three different panelists um, have been brought together with different viewpoints and different areas of expertise, obviously, to try and help us address this. So I'm going to briefly describe the three and what their background is, and then each of them is going to kind of address one specific area that I will lead in with. Um, and we will end with <laughs> Sid, who is stuck in a box over there. Uh, so he knows that he's coming last, and obviously you will have noticed there were a few technical issues related to that, so um, we will go into that. But first, we're going to start over here with Dr. Sarah Mola, who has worked for around 10 years as an English teacher and a Russian-English interpreter, and then received a PhD in linguistics and cognitive science at UC Boulder. So before then, she worked for four years as a linguist knowledge engineer in AI, so one from industry. Um, Dr. Moller's research expands AI methods to the study of endangered languages and uses insight from language science to improve natural language processing models in order to facilitate equitable access to AI technology for all ways of speaking all languages. Next up, we have Dr. David Gray Grant, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy here at UF, and also a senior research fellow in digital ethics and governance. His research focuses on ethical challenges raised by automated decision-making systems and autonomous software agents. Before coming to UF, David was a postdoc at Harvard University, where he ran the Embedded Ethics Teaching Lab as part of his work with the Embedded Ethics at Harvard program. And then head in the box is Dr. Sid Dobrin, who is professor and chair in the Department of English. And much of his research focuses on emerging technologies and writing studies. He is the founding director of the Trace Innovation Initiative in the Department of English. He serves as a digital thought leader for Adobe and is a member of the Florida Institute for National Security, which is affiliated with the UF's AI Initiative. He is currently editing a, a collection titled AI and the Humanities. So each of our panelists was given a prompt, each of them given a different prompt to kind of introduce themselves and this topic to everybody here. After we've gone through all three panelists, I also have questions that myself and perhaps ChatGPT may have come up with, as well as ChatGPT's answers to said questions. Um, but also, we would like to open it up and engage with the audience and see what questions you all have, too. So as you're going along, if you have questions, just jot them down, and there will be a Q&A in the second half for us to really try and get into some of these issues in more depth. So first, we're going to start with Sarah. And Sarah was asked to look at what ChatGPT is and how it works. So a nice introduction for us, Sarah. All right. So ChatGPT is a chatbot or a conversational agent. So it's a, a model that's been programmed to respond appropriately to 
context. This is what you might do in a conversation or an essay in response to a topic prompt. How it works, um, so language technology has to imitate two, among other things, two key features and seeming paradoxical features of human language, um, which on one hand is creativity. So we're saying sentences every day that no one has ever said before. On the other hand, these sentences have to be produced within a complex and somewhat rigid structure. Um, so how the computer learns to imitate that is um, actually easier to illustrate than explain. So I'm going to try this. I'm going to let you guys be my artificial intelligence. And I'm going to be the user. And I have in, um, in mind a four-word phrase that uh, I'm going to give you one word at a time. So I'll give you a word, and then just without thinking, because it's artificial intelligence, um, just based on your intuitive knowledge of English, when I motion to you, say out loud whatever you think is the most likely word to occur next. OK? So you're going to predict. All right, so a four-word phrase. The first word is green. So I say green, and you're going to say the next most likely word to be. OK. So we're going to do this. If we hear more people in the room, so speak loudly, uh, saying the same word, then we're going to say that it's probably something that a computer could predict as well. So first word was green. Second word I have in mind is eggs. Green eggs. OK. Uh, my third word is and. So uh, I'm going to say green eggs and, and you'll predict the fourth word to be bears. OK. Um, hmm, interesting. Uh, well, obviously, I chose that phrase because I knew it would work. Right. Um, anybody who's learned to read in America, and especially if you have young children who are learning to read, you've heard this phrase green eggs and ham very frequently. Um, and so you're conscious of that frequency. Um, you're conscious of that phrase. But the computer also actually can leverage uh, the same frequency effect. Um, and it does that by looking, um, whereas humans, we think, tend to produce language in sentences, it looks at language as something that's both bigger and at the same time smaller than the sentence. So what's bigger is it has, as we heard, a bunch of examples of English sentences from all sorts of sources, billions of words, more than you and I could read in our whole lifetime. But the smaller part is it's not looking at the whole sentence. It's actually looking at windows of words, of three or four, or five, at the most, ten words. And just like you did, it's um, taking, say, three words, say, the first three words in that huge corpus of text, and then it's looking through all of that text, trying to find wherever those three words occur, the exact same three words in the same order. And then it's as if it had a dictionary of English words. It will get all those examples of those three words, and it will look at the next word. And then it will see whatever word happens next and check off each of the words it sees as often as it sees those words occur. And when you do that, it turns out that um, we're not maybe as creative as we like to think. We're creatures of habit. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me. What happens is <clears throat> a lot of those words get repeated. And so you have a frequency effect happening. And so it's able to use that and leverage that. Um, and then it will just go over one word and take the next window. And so you have this overlapping effect so that um, with that is actually learning to imitate the structure of language by having the connection of the words as they go. <coughs> um, it works for English because the most prominent feature of the complex structure of English is a very strict word order. Um, but here's the thing. I wasn't actually going to say green eggs and ham. That wasn't what I had in mind. I was going to say green eggs and shamrock. And if that seems at all improbable or weird to you, that's also illustrating the frequency effect. It's not a very frequent phrase that you would might hear. But um, as it happens, uh, I'm a professor, so naturally, well, it's a third way through the semester, so naturally my thoughts are going towards my next break, um, which spring break, that's middle of March, middle of March, March, St. Patrick's Day, St. Patrick's Day green. I have good memories. I have vague memories of coming down as a child to breakfast and seeing food on the table that was green that normally should not have been green with the magic of food coloring. And um, also there's this picture of this plant that appears all over that 
364 days out of the year we call clover, but this time of the year we call shamrock. Um, okay, so if as I'm giving you these, these prompts in context, you're thinking, okay, that's a bit more reasonable. That's also illustrating the frequency effect of language. Um, and also why ChatGPT has kind of exploded as something better than other language models, because it has been able, well, it's actually brought in direct human feedback, among other things, to reinforce the responses that the model gives in a way that says, okay, yeah, this is a good model, or a good response to this context, this is not such a good response. So in a sense, it's choosing its uh, frequency effect in response to the context. So if it's all words like leprechaun, Ireland, St. Patrick's Day, March, it, it might produce green eggs and shamrock rather than green eggs and ham. Um, and so that's how it has learned or seems to have learned to respond creatively to context as if it actually understood what was being said. Um, whereas actually what's happening in a nutshell, the main engine of these models is just counting words as if it were bean counting and then using some probability um, to then predict or to uh, imitate patterns which turns out are more predictable in the way we use language than we might like to think. So that's how it works in a nutshell. Thank you. That was very cool and apparently I'm very predictable. So there you go. <laughs> Works really well on my stuff. Um, okay, so next up, David has been asked to look at ethical challenges raised by the chat GPT system for higher education and for society in general. David. All right. Um, so you've probably heard that chat GPT has created a crisis in higher education uh, because it makes it incredibly easy to cheat on writing assignments. Uh, so rather than going through all the trouble of you know, researching and outlining and drafting and revising and proofreading your paper, um, you can just copy paste the prompt into chat GPT and push a button. Um, and then you get like a well-written essay that's uh, good enough to earn a C or maybe even a B. Um, that's not just free, it's also currently untraceable. So we don't um, currently have a reliable way to tell if an essay was written by a chatbot. Um, so two questions about that. So first, is that plagiarism? And second, you know, why is this a big deal? So um, you might think that using ChatGPT to do your homework isn't plagiarism, um, because plagiarism is presenting someone else's work as your own, um, and ChatGPT isn't a person. So I think this is sort of beside the point. So whether we call it plagiarism or not um, doesn't really matter, because at any rate, it's academic dishonesty. So when a professor asks you to write an essay in response to some question, the assignment's to do some research and think about how to answer the question, and then like generate an essay that distills the results. Um, and if instead of doing that, you just type the prompt into ChatGPT and then submit the results, you're turning in work uh, that you're pretending you've done um, when actually you, you didn't do that work. And so that's academic dishonesty. Okay, so with that out of the way, so why should we care about this? Why is this a big deal? Um, well, I think the concern is that this could really lead to an epidemic of plagiarism. Um, so why might that happen? Well, on the one hand, it might not feel like it's cheating to students. And on the other hand, it uh, might seem a lot less risky than more traditional forms of cheating because it's not traceable. Um, and if we were to experience an epidemic like that, then that would be a problem for universities for uh, at least two reasons. So one is that it wouldn't be fair, obviously, to students who do the work. Um, you know, grades matter in our society. There's used to distribute all kinds of scarce resources, like uh, scholarships and jobs. Um, so we really do have an ac obligation in academia to make sure that grades mean what they're supposed to mean. Uh, but it would also widespread, uh, widespread cheating would also undermine our ability to um, make sure that students are prepared to make valuable contributions to society. So we don't make essays because we like students to make students do work. Uh, we do it because we think it's going to help them develop valuable skills. Um, so for example, the process of, so I'm a philosophy professor, the process of writing analytical essays doesn't just teach you how to write. Um, it also teaches you how to break down complex ideas and apply them to new contexts, um, the ability to make and evaluate all arguments and all of the other skills that we think of as um, collectively constituting critical thinking. Um, so we really do need to think about how to avoid a situation in which students can just easily bypass our writing assignments because um, uh, otherwise it won't be fair to students who do the work um, and students who do choose to cheat won't be learning what we need them to learn. Um, as far as broader social concerns go, um, I'll talk about three different things briefly. So there are a lot of things we might discuss here, but I'm going to focus on three. Um, misinformation, bias, and job loss. Um, so misinformation first. So ChatGPT can give you an authoritative sounding answer to almost any question that you ask it. Um, that's fantastic when it gives you the right answer, but it's not so great when it lies to you. 
uh, which it has a surprisingly strong tendency to do, as we, as we saw. Um, so my favorite example of this is one user early on asked it what the fastest marine mammal was, um, and it said that it was the, it just insisted it was the peregrine falcon, um, which is you know, very fast, but it's not a marine creature, and it's also not a mammal. Um, so what's going on here? So importantly, um, what's going on is probably not that ChatGPT is just repeating something that it was on the internet, which was used to train it. Um, ChatGPT and tools based on similar technologies have the surprising tendency to make up or uh, hallucinate information that's not in the training data. Um, and since they do that in an authoritative tone um, and backed up by plausible sounding arguments, it can be really difficult to tell when they're um, telling you the truth. Um, this has already caused significant real world problems. So Stack Exchange is an internet forum where um, programmers can post technical questions and get answers from members of the community. Um, right after ChatGPT was released, um, users of the forum realized that it could be used to generate answers to exactly the kinds of questions that uh, people tend to ask on Stack Exchange. Um, so users realizing this started flooding the forum with these sort of answers from ChatGPT. Um, and since thousands of people were doing this, the forum's moderators just weren't able to keep up with the flood of this information, and they had to ban the use of the tool. So this took about like a week after ChatGPT was released to happen. Okay, so there's two upshots of that story. Um, so one is that um, tools like ChatGPT are currently quite unreliable, which means that you know, it's important to keep in mind um, those limitations when you use them, especially if it's for something important. Um, but the other is that these tools really have a tremendous ability to automate the spread of misinformation. Um, so the spread of misinformation online is already a really serious problem that we don't have good solutions for, um, and this new generation of chatbots is going to threaten to make that problem a whole lot worse. All right, so second issue, uh, bias. Uh, there's an old saying in computer science, which is garbage in, garbage out. So what does that mean? So it means that if the data that you put into a computer system is flawed in some way, then you're probably going to get flawed results back out. Um, so ChatGPT, as you heard, was trained on huge swaths of the internet. And there's a lot of good stuff in there, but there's also a lot of bad stuff too. Um, and so in addition to toxic and dangerous content, um, which ChatGPT can definitely uh, reproduce. So they said that they filtered the data, but uh, users have shown that it contains all sorts of dangerous and toxic information. Um, it's also full of a lot of stereotypes. Um, so since ChatGPT was trained on data that's full of various harmful stereotypes, um, it has a tendency to behave in ways that reproduce them. Um, so one example is that uh, a researcher asked it to write a script that would tell you if someone was a good scientist based on their race and their gender. Um, and it did that. So it wrote a script that uh, if you input that it's a white male, it says good scientist, um, and otherwise it says not a good scientist. Um, so Lots of smart people are working on this problem, this problem of bias, um, and lots of people are working on the hallucination problem. Um, but they really are very hard problems to solve, um, and we really shouldn't expect perfect solutions. So as a result, um, we're all going to need to be very vigilant as we use these tools to make sure that we don't end up doing more harm than good. All right, so the last problem that I'm going to mention is job loss. Uh, so uh, the CEO of Microsoft, who's Satya Nadella, um, was recently interviewed about ChatGPT at Davos. Um, he was being interviewed because Microsoft is a major investor um, in OpenAI. Um, so he mentioned that um, one of the world's leading AI re uh, researchers, who's the person who developed Tesla's autopilot software, um, he headed up that team. So he claims that 80% uh, of the code that he writes now is written by something called um, GitHub Copilot. Um, so that's another OpenAI tool, and it can write code on the basis of a sort of prompt in plain English. So um, Nadella's take on this was that, you know, this is really fantastic for workers. We're all going to be, like, so much more productive as a result of these tools. Uh, but there's another way of looking at it, obviously, which is that um, now companies are going to be able to use these technologies to get more done with fewer workers. Um, and that could mean that there are a lot of really good jobs um, that you might have thought were exactly the kind of jobs that you couldn't automate um, that might start going away. Um, so what we need to worry about here is that some people might just get left behind because they don't have the skills that employers now need. So we need to think about, as a society, how we can realize the benefits of these technologies um, without leaving a lot of people worse off. Okay, so just to bring things back to higher education, so, uh, you know, as academics think about how we redesign our assignments to make them chat GPT proof, um, we also need to be thinking about how we can redesign the curriculum um, so that we prepare students for a world in which these chatbots play um, increasingly important roles. And I think that's something that... Uh, Cities might need to talk about. Sid, can you hear us? Yes, indeed. Oh, sweet. Just uh, seems like an obvious question, but you'd be surprised. Um, okay, so our third panelist uh, is Dr. Sid Dobrin, 
Sid is going to now cover for us a brief introduction on the beneficial possibilities rather than the downside risks associated with chat GPTs or similar. Sid? Or something like that. Um, I actually am going to pick up a little bit on what the others have said uh, throughout this. And I want to speak about uh, some ways to think about how chat GPT and other similar AI applications might affect what we do as teachers, particularly as teachers of writing, and how that might lead to some positive impact, as uh, my colleague just mentioned about the future of education here. And given yesterday's announcement from Google about the release of BARD, which is Google's competitor with ChatGPT, not to mention other apps like Hugging Face or Jasper, we have to acknowledge that the importance of these AI generators are not a new fad or something that only a few tech savvy students are going to be engaging. They are now part of how students and professionals read and write. And though I won't go into it here today, we also need to acknowledge that these kinds of writer bots are really not new and they've been employed across many industries for at least a decade now. And so to that end, I want to start off by saying that the important questions that we as research and teacher, researchers and teachers need to be asking about AI platforms like ChatGPT and BARD, the very platforms that our students are and will be using, are not questions about what these platforms do, but what they will do in 5, 10, 20 years down the line. So in order to start thinking about the future of AI and education and how we can help our students to work in this world, I want to first respond to the sense of moral crisis that has proliferated alongside the recent media infatuation with ChatGPT. That very large scale reaction across educational institutions that inspires panels just like this all across the country. Now, interestingly, not an hour ago, I received an email from a company, I'm not going to say the company's name, but they wanted to demo for me their new platform that, quote, combats AI-generated essays. And that seems to be this prevailing attitude that we want to combat these AI writing bots. But here's the thing. When it comes to technology, there is nothing new about these cries of moral crisis in the future of writing, writing instruction, and education in general. We've heard the same things about every writing technology that interacts with the production of and teaching of writing. Wikipedia, word processors, spell checkers, grammar checkers, citation generators, chalkboards, the printing press, copy machines, ballpoint pens, pencils, and in fact, writing itself. Remember all the outrage against Wikipedia back in the early 2000s and the fear that students might use it rather than conducting actual research when they're writing? Teachers and educational institutions held meetings, they had panels just like this one, and they filled syllabi with rules banning students from accessing Wikipedia. It's interesting that within a decade of Wikipedia's introduction, the educational outrage not only dissipated, but the teachers from then till now ask students to write wiki pages or revise and edit pages that are already existing as common writing assignments. Imagine, too, a writing class now that bans word processors, spell checkers, grammar checkers, citation generators, or any other technology that teachers have vilified as the death of writing and education when they first, first appeared. Because you see, technology, and I mean all technology, always has two paths. It either becomes ubiquitous and is naturalized into our backgrounds, and it just becomes the way we do things or it becomes obsolete, most often because another technology has superseded its use. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to give up on everything we know about writing, about good writing, and about good teaching. It means that we have to apply some of those approaches to these new contexts, and we have to change some because of these new contexts. Now, you would better believe that right now, textbook companies are designing course materials and content delivery systems to account for these new technologies. They're also designing AI chatbots that will provide students with fundamental writing instruction for these new writing contexts. I know this because I talked to the publishers about these things. Now, I'm not going to get into the potential for teacher bots right now, though it is something I've worked on and because I want to talk about bots that are making new, the news now. So what does come next? Well, schools, colleges, and universities, we're not going to be the purveyors of what comes next for AI for writing industry, publication, and public communication will be. Right now, the headline garnering chat GPT can produce fundamental writing that is generic. And as Dean Richardson just showed us, it's not always right. 
However, as companies develop algorithms that are discipline specific, that mine context that is more distinct to specific contexts, those AIs will start building more complex and more context specific abilities and will produce more dynamic and more useful writing. Let me give you an example. I want you to think about the U.S. outdoor recreational industry, which accounts for 1.9% of the U.S. GDP, about $454 billion per year. This is an industry that relies on the ability to perpetually and rapidly produce nearly endless content in the form of magazines, product descriptions, travel guides, advertisements, videos, reviews, social media posts, and so on. When this industry further develops AI writing bots specific to its needs, or more specifically, when tech companies develop these bots and sell access to them to specific industries, as they already are, those bots will produce the writing that is both needed and effective. Subscription AI services will inevitably become the norm for much of the content produced for commercial consumption, and many companies will build their own writing bots for specific and private needs. And companies like Jasper AI are really banking on this. Anecdotally, I should say, I have a friend who works for a PR firm in the outdoor industry, and she recently told me that her company had fired about a dozen writers and hired a single AI expert to oversee content production for their publications. This is going to become the norm, and educational institutions that are attentive to their students' career paths and student success will need to prepare their students in how to use AI for these new kinds of positions. So teachers will not need to abandon the important critical thinking, problem-solving, effective communication skills that we teach college writers, the kinds of skills and methods that stand as central to a liberal arts education. But we will need to redirect those objectives into a new AI-driven context. And doing so doesn't eliminate or reduce what we've always done. It opens up the possibilities of what we can do. And we have to recognize, too, that we function in what we might understand as a template culture of writing. We are open to the efficiency of using web page templates, video templates, resume templates, report templates, replicated codes in our computer programs, and so on, because they allow writers and designers and coders to circulate content without having to start from scratch. As readers, we are willing to accept the inclusion of stock images, stock music, stock video, much of which is AI created or AI modified, and we accept these in the documents we read. AI written content now adds stock writing to the conversation, but for some reason, we're more defensive about protecting the idea of original writing as more valuable than other forms of content. So where I'm going with all of this is that ChatGPT, Bard, Jasper, and so many other AI writers are not the demise of education as so much of the press wants us to believe, but are an opportunity to reinvigorate education, specifically liberal arts education, within the context of the world our students are going to need to live and work in. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sid. So is Sid going to be able to hear us now or no? Yep, okay, it looked like he was engaged in it. Okay, nice to have you with us, Sid. Uh, one comment to the two panelists, if you can lean into the microphone when you speak so they can pick you up at the back. Okay, we have the old lady glasses on and off issue. Um, so at this point in time, we would like to open the floor for any discussion questions. And as I mentioned before, I also have chat GPT questions that are very specific. So you tailor it enough, you're going to get it to tell you what you want, as we all know. Um, so we have both. So we can alternate between them. If we have some great questions from the floor, we can just go with that. And we do have all three panelists, so they can all address questions that are raised, or they can choose to go with ones that it's more their area of expertise. So does anyone want to kick us off with a question? OK. I'll just take advantage of the fact that I work here. But <laughs> I just wanted to ask if you feel like social science majors will essentially become obsolete with something like um, ChatGPT. I know we mentioned like this reinvigorating it, but I am curious, like, what does that mean for academia moving forward? Like, will we kind of move towards like a unified front where all of our writing sounds the same or like nothing innovative and new is being contributed? I'll take that. Um, talking about social sciences, 
So linguistics would be under so social sciences, and I have a friend who uh, did anthropological linguistics uh, for her PhD, and she's now working for a tech company doing user interface research. So it's not um, necessarily like chat GPT related, but as Sid was saying, these, these technologies are, are changing the world. Um, there is concern for job loss, but there's also job creation. So with more technology and more people using technology, it's become very important for companies um, not just to have the technology, but to have one that's easier and better to use. So how do you figure out if yours is easier and better to use? You have to do social science research, which is exactly what my friend is doing in industry, earning lots of money. Anybody else want to add to that? David or Sid? I mean, it's worth mentioning that we don't, like, it's not as if these systems can automate the process of doing scientific research. I mean, we're nowhere close to that. Um, so I don't think social science major. I mean, we're still going to need people to study the social world I mean, for the foreseeable future. Sid? Yeah, we also have to keep in mind that when we say writing, that's a very generic term. And there are different kinds of writings. And, you know, a large chunk of the writing that gets done in industry is never intended to be read by anyone. It's for record keeping. And so part of what we have to ask in that question about the social sciences isn't just what discipline will this affect, but what are the kinds of writing that this thing can and cannot do effectively? It's not turning out, you know, beautiful prose, but it is certainly turning out very effective, good enough kinds of writing in specific contexts. So uh, I think the question, the question of will this, how, the, how this will affect writing needs to be broken up to what kinds of writing. Any other questions? Hi. To Dr. Grant, um, do you believe that like subscription-based um, like AI services, like some of these chat bots um, that draw from free like databases, owe anything to said databases? Yeah, good uh, and difficult question. Uh, right. So, um, so there's a lot of so, so these you chain these chat bots on like millions of documents, and then they're able to. Um, write text um, that's based on those documents, but then they don't cite their sources. And there's a, a question there about um, whether um, that's, we should think of that as a kind of plagiarism. Um, interestingly, um, there's a, a website, a uh, news website that was using ChatGPT to write stories. Um, and an event, like a big site, I'm not gonna name it, a big site. Um, and uh, an investigation found that it, it seemed to have been sort of like directly plagiarizing competitors. Like, so like taking text from articles written by competitors and then like changing the wording around a little bit. And so, yeah, there, there are big worries about content attribution with these services because they're not currently good at citing. And I, Microsoft just released a new version of Bing um, that's chat GPT powered, and it seems to be able to do some citations. So maybe that's that's a short-term limitation. But yeah, um, as far as um, whether compensation is owed, I mean, some people think so. So a lawsuit was recently filed against uh, the creators of, I think, Midjourney, which is this uh, image generation app um, by artists because the system um, was trained on their artwork without consent. Um, and then can produce art very similar to it. And so I think there's a plausible case there that maybe you might owe some sort of compensation. It's a little bit harder to know what to think about um, articles written about general purpose topics uh, that are based on lots and lots of different sources. Like if I write an essay about um, you know, cell structure of a certain kind of plant, it's, we don't typically think that I need to then pay the people who wrote all the sources I used, although I, I do need to cite them. And it's not just art, I think music is as well. Music, you can train it based on different performers, and it will write music of that genre or even the merged genres. That's with the same question, right? Be it art, text, images, music, they're all similar questions. Yeah, Google uh, released a system that uh, can make accordion death metal. <laughs> I strangely want to listen to that now. Uh, guess what? I'll be Googling tonight. Um, other questions? Can I add something to that real quick? Oh, sorry, Sid's going to go first, and we'll go to the question up front. Sorry, Sid. So just, just real quick, part of the, the underlying part of that question, too, is that we're operating with definitions of plagiarism and intellectual property and such that were created in a literate world, in a print technology world. And the digital technology world is having us rethink a lot of those definitions just in the same way that we're having to rethink our understandings of things like security, surveillance, privacy, social interaction. Part of it is that as more and more of these, these AI writers are 
putting out music and art, it's the question of are we going to adhere to a print culture's rules for how those operate, or are we going to create new rules in a digital world that fit the new context? Thanks, Ed. Next question. How uh, how well does ChatGPT work to emulate like human speech? Like you, if you were to ask it, uh, oh, speak like a eight year old would or something, you know? That's a good question. I haven't tried ChatGPT, but in general, um, one of the things that ChatGPT and the the models that have, other models have been dealt in the past few years have done uh, really great on is being able to switch genres. That wasn't true a few years ago. Once you could train it on a certain genre, once you switch genre, performance went down. Um, speech technology, original, you train it on one speaker, switch it to another speaker, it would go down. Train it on a bunch of men's voices, give it one woman's voice in the same language, couldn't handle it. Um, generally, once you get out of English, uh, your models just they can't handle it, um, and there's a few reasons for that. Um, there's so much more data available for English on the internet, a lot more data. Um, and then the other reason actually works not only for English, which is the most prominent language on the internet, you can scrape up the data, but also true for the most spoken language, a Mandarin, and actually um, you're talking about written that covers more languages than Mandarin because it the writing can be used for multiple related languages that have the similar feature. What English and, and these languages, Mandarin and uh, those languages have in common is uh, two things, a, str a strict word order and a very simple word structure. So every kind of element of meaning is separated into a different word. And those words don't change, you just put them in the right order. So these, you know, taking windows of words works pretty well. It's gonna occur more or less in the same order. There's not a lot of variation. That's not true for most languages in the world, um, even other European languages. English is somewhat unique in that way, um, that we have, there's more complex word structures, and with that comes more free word order. So you need more examples because you have more variation in what word, like subject verbs can go in different order. So if there's more variation, you need more examples so you can imitate it. And then this, what's called the out of vocabulary problem for language technology, it, it, computer can't tell that dog and dogs are related. It has no idea. I mean, it's as different to the computer as an and and, one letter difference. So you have to tell the computer, you have to program it um, to recognize these systematic relations between a singular and a plural noun, or uh, walk and walking and walked, all the tenses and moods, which are pretty simple in English. Um, in other languages, it gets really complex. So you have um, not just like for English verbs, like up to six or something different forms that you can have, but you can have dozens, dozens and even hundreds of variations of one word. And every one of those is a new problem for the computer. It hasn't seen that before. It can't realize there's a relation. So you have to deal with the complex structure. Um, so all sorts of complexities, I could go on and on, but you. Yeah, once you get out of English, once you get out of um, anything with a lot of data, or once you get into a language that has more complexities, it just, this stuff is just not available. And so then for varieties of English, um, speech technology doesn't work with someone who hasn't, who doesn't speak similar to whatever voices they use to train those. And ChatGPT is a little bit easier because they grabbed everything from the internet and you have all sorts of writing genres and you have a lots and lots of data. So it's working a little bit better than other technology. But. David. Uh, this is just so directly related to the question. I get. So uh, the New York Times did this thing where they had ChatGPT generate a bunch of stories that were supposed to have been written by school children. Um, you know, exactly the kind of prompts that kids get when they're, um, when they're very young at school. Um, and then they had experts try to tell which stories were written by actual school children and which stories were written by ChatGPT. Um, and the experts got it, uh, got it wrong a lot of the time. So yeah, it's pretty good at, at imitating. It, you can also ask it to explain things at different grade levels. So you can get it to explain a concept at a third grade, uh, grade level or at like a college grade level. Um, and it's quite good at that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think with Jasper AI, because I played with that a few years ago, you can tell it exactly what you want. You can give it a tone of voice. You can say whether you want academic or entertainment or informal like, and age. And you can say not only age, but gender. 
So you can say 14-year-old middle school boy, not that my son would do that, um, and have it play with that text for you. And you can actually do it down to that level. So, I think there's a really interesting ethical question there too, Jane, in what you're, you're describing, because we've seen, for instance, with uh, ChatGPT, that um, we have to remember that all these algorithms are written by humans. And so there are still aspects of how we think about things built into the algorithm. So for instance, um, I saw a recent uh, experiment where ChatGPT was asked to write an article in the style of CNN, and it turned out the article as though CNN were right, would write it. But then when you were asked, asked ChatGPT to write an article in the style of, say, a right-wing news outlet, it responds, I cannot do that because I cannot give out false information. And so the ethics of the politics of who's determining what it will and won't do in those kinds of stylistic and, uh, and ethical approaches, we have to remember there's still a coder behind all that who's giving it. These things are not 100% objective. And so we have to remember that when you ask it to speak like an eight-year-old or a third grader or whatever, those have to be coded in and described what that is. And that has an ethical ramification to it. A huge one. Other questions? Okay, let's go to the middle there first, I think. Hi. Um, so jobs are changing as automa automation makes some obsolete and creates others. Um, so this always happens with new technology in the past and in the present, but never at this rate. Um, how as a university can we keep pace with new jobs requiring new technological skills, considering how long it might take to create a new major or change coursework? So I can hit that one first. So, so UF is already heavily invested, right, in AI through a donation by Chris Malakowski, an unbelievable donation, both in terms of resources and computing resources, as well as manpower. We have actually a staff uh, now that will help you work with a lot of this. So we're ahead of the game on, in some ways compared to other campuses. Um, and even then, it is exactly what you say. How do we react quickly? I would say in general, universities are perhaps not the quickest or most adept at change, right? Just because of the infrastructure we have. So we're already looking at that. We already had 6,000 students last year take courses in AI. Already existing courses, kind of in a, informally tagged as an AI course. And we're bringing on a new curriculum committee that will tag courses in five different types of AI categories, specifically linked to the C3 center here on campus, so the Korea Connection Center, working with them. They've hired an AI career person to link directly with industry to try and make sure that the skills you're learning are directly related to those in industry. And linking with what Sid just brought up, um, there are so much to do with ethics, bias, fairness, equity, all of these issues with AI and the reinforcement of stereotypes in data sets is a horrific problem with that. So this way, one entire quarter of our categories of AI courses are actually AI ethics, bias, and fairness, and equity, because those are big issues, right? As soon as we get into this, it's come up a number of times, I think. David mentioned it earlier as well. So addressing those issues. So we're trying to adapt very quickly from the career end all the way through the intro level class. There's already a certificate for any major. There have been over 100 hires in all 16 colleges, so no college has been ignored. Obviously, there are some, like engineering obviously has a lot more already, and there are already over 400 faculty already working in this field. I think Sid referenced it, it's not new. Um, I am not young and I did my PhD work using machine learning and AI, right? So this isn't new. You're right that the speed of some of these introductions are freaking people out. But again, a lot of them have been around for a long time in industry where it's really in the open now. It's here for discussion. It's on a panel. Um, and that's great, right? That's where we want it to be. We want it to be out in the open and discussed. We also want it to be a resource that everyone can access, that it's not for a select few that it's not behind a paywall, which currently, you know, it isn't. Some of the others are. Jasper AI, I think, is $1,000 a year to, to have a, a membership there. So I think a lot of those issues are coming up. There are responses, and not just at UF, but 
we were way ahead of the game, courtesy of you know the Chris Malakowski and Nvidia gift straight up. I mean, that's what put us ahead of the game. So um, I think you're fortunate that you're at a university that already has these certificates for every major, but right now you, you have to go seek them, right? You have to go find out about them. And the AI Squared Center, which is the academic home for AI, kind of generation of data and at least sharing of that information is a good first place to start. But, but yeah, it's gonna be a rapidly changing landscape and that's kind of fun, right? That's an opportunity and an engagement as well. You'll be better trained than most of your peers coming out of UF and that will get you those jobs before they do. I'm going to add on to that because I was in industry and I was in a humanities industry, if you will, job. And then when I switched over to technology and I saw the huge difference in job opportunities for myself and then being in a PhD in linguistics department, seeing, again, this disparity in job opportunities or how long people were hunting and looking for jobs and how many people they're competing against if they were not willing or not to go into technology with their um, humanities and social science degrees. So I thought a lot about this, um, and I think about this when I'm interacting with my students. And what I think of is there's two things. One is to go back to the basics. Um, there are skills that work for any job that you should emphasize on. So communication would be one. Um, having been someone who's hired people and been responsible for them getting fired, but um, well deserved. Um, communication is huge. Are you going to communicate? Um, I'd say after reading, writing, arithmetic, can you communi communicate well? Do you keep up with that, and do you stand out? So a good reason not to use ChatGPT for your essays, right? Become better, use the tools and then become better. Help use your teachers to help you stand out. So there's the basic skills and then there's a the learning new skills. So I read an article years ago, um, well not that long ago, but it, it was longer ago, it was like maybe 10 years ago or so. Um, so it wasn't like just in the past few years with all this coming up about how computer programming is going to be the new uh, blue collar job in the next 50 years. Everybody will have to know how to do it and it will be a dime a dozen. Um, which, and I think shortly after that, Google started hiring people without college degrees as programmers. Um, so basic skills, so I try to encourage without pushing people into things that are not interesting to, for all of my linguistic students to learn basic computer programming, which I offer a class if you wanna take it. Um, but learning new skills. And then one of the biggest reasons I got into the AI industry is because I was a linguist working, linguist working at a natural language processing industry, so AI company with programmers, and I, we were trying to solve the same problem, and I just, for the life of me, could not figure out what we were talking about. Like, their way they thought and the way I thought about these language problems were so different. Um, so just thinking about how you communicate can and being able to understand just a little bit, even if you don't really like programming, but you understand how it works, you can stand out in industry right now. So lots of ideas there. Okay, there was, where was the next question? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this question is for all the panelists. Uh, I was enjoying my last days on TikTok before it's banned, and I came across a video of a teacher who had an assignment for the students. So it was, it went to something along the lines of write a book report on Hamlet. And I'll, as we learned, ChatGPT got a lot of it wrong. So what she did was she scratched out the parts that were wrong, printed it out for her students, and had them, um, had them fill out the rest of it as a, as a test, as an assignment. As educators, do you have any assignments that are creative like that to uh, as Dr. Dobrin mentioned, not combat it, but adjust. Go for it, David. Uh, I'm teaching a course on the philosophy of artificial intelligence. So the first half is like classic questions about philosophy of mind and AI, um, and the second half is ethical issues. So my students are currently working on a paper um, where uh, the question is, is ChatGPT intelligent? Um, in the way that we're intelligent. Um, and so they're doing some experimentation and they're reading some articles. But I mean, this is really just sort of a fun way into an old problem, which is like, what is intelligence? And could computers be intelligence? But yeah, that's, that's one thing I'm doing. That's all I've got, though. I don't have anything. I know, I know a number of faculty are doing, basically asking the students to engage with ChatGPT, because they already know that they are, <laughs> and asking for them to basically cut and paste the text that you get back for these different prompts and then evaluate, improve, and correct that text. In part, to teach them 
ChatGPT really likes to make things up and don't get me started with the citations, which are 100% fabricated, by the way. They just make them up, but they sound good. They'll be the right journal, right volume, right year, right page numbers. The rest of it's completely fiction. You Google Scholar it, it doesn't exist. But it sounds like a paper you should have read because it looks really good. It's, it's scary, right? David and I were talking about it before. So why not teach those things? Why not actually engage in it in that way and have the students be the ones to realize and evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of this as a tool, which is what it is, right? It's a good tool in some cases and an awful tool in others, depending on viewpoint. But, but why not do that, right? And I know a, a number of faculty are already engaging in that way. He already incorporated a whole provision in the syllabus about um, chat GPT and if you're going to use it you have to cite it and he also had assignments on having students generate stuff um, with chat GPT, chat GPT and then um, reevaluating exactly what you are saying but I've come up with another question <laughs> um, in the realm of bias um, and equity um, what do you think about jobs being created to actually address directly address those issues and when you're talking about language, natural language processing and, and chat GPT in, in the sense that it Mandarin and English, the most widely spoken languages, and I would assume maybe Arabic too, are the most accessible. So which is a, an equity, uh, you know, access to, to AI technology per se, and that which could also affect access to that as, as an educational tool. Um, so addressing that as an issue, but I'm thinking about also bias in data, the training data that we feed AI I don't know if this is already, you know, being done or thought of. I mean, obviously, when you're in machine learning and training, you're always trying to improve the training data, right? But, you know, jobs being created to, to improve that, to help eliminate that. I wonder, I'm just wondering what you think if these would be sort of future jobs, you know, to actually head on address bias, you know, to try to incorporate more diverse training data sets from more diverse populations, et cetera. I mean, for sure. I'm hiring students right now to work on that for um, speech recognition for African-American uh, English. Uh, there's lots of interest in this in industry. They, you know, they know that's important or they know that it's important for them to think it, to show that it's important. Um, yeah, these are, these are huge issues. A lot of my research is focused on that, especially for non-dominant languages. Um, why should anyone have to switch out of their native language with which they connect with their family and friends and they're most fluent in just to be able to get the same opportunities that other people in the world can get because we speak English or Mandarin or some other language that just keeps pro proliferating on the internet. Um, I guess it's, those are my thoughts. It, should, it needs to be addressed, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a huge growth area um, like sort of under the heading of AI safety. So there's, there's a lot of researchers now um, who are really like making careers out of thinking about how to combat bias in these systems. That's a lot of different fields. So like my own research is about how to, how to think about bias and um, AI-based decision making. Um, on the accessibility thing, yeah, I mean, the, I mentioned the um, Microsoft CEO talking about this programmer automating um, his coding tasks. Um, he also mentioned that there's a, like a governmental entity in um, India, I forget where exactly, um, that had trained a similar model on um, a bunch of like government policy documents. Um, and then on a bunch of different languages and was using this to try to make um, information about how to get access to government services um, accessible to people who don't, um, who speak sort of uh, less common languages. So yeah, there's tremendous potential to, to make almost anything more accessible. Sid, do you have any comments? I actually couldn't hear the question, so I'm just kind of uh, picking up on what uh, the other panelists have said. Yeah, so the question is one looking at whether the issues of bias and inequality in the data sources themselves may actually create new jobs to help correct and fill in those data issues that occur due to AI using all of this in biased data to begin with. So is that kind of potentially an opening where we might get new jobs and new services um, kind of being developed as a function of these chat GPT type techniques? Yeah, absolutely. And I actually see that as two different kinds of avenues to thinking about 
not just the jobs that AI will bring about, but how we actually think and teach about AI. And I'll be really reductive here because a question like that is really asking us two questions. One is how is the AI being deployed? And I tend to think of that as applied AI, how the AI is being used, which is you know one of the missions here of UF's AI uh, initiative. But the other side is what we might think of as theoretical AI. And that's the kind of AI work that a lot of us, particularly in the humanities, are doing about asking about the ramifications of this. So there's also that other end of it of being sort of theoretical and thinking about how AI is going to function and then how do we turn that into the application. And so whether that generates you know, more jobs or new jobs, sure, but I think the bigger question there is how are we going to think about what those jobs might be rather than just let's apply the AI, let's apply the AI. I'd like to add to that, um, kind of also connect to some of the other questions you had about jobs and social sciences. So in 2014, the Department of Defense uh, um, funded a huge research, with multiple industries and universities to build um, machine translation for under-resourced languages. And their, their case study was um, the, the earthquake in Haiti had happened recently, and they realized that Haitian um, language, people were writing in it, texting in it about where they needed help or where people, um, supplies were, and the humanitarian aid workers weren't able to access this stuff very quickly. It was all up there on the internet, but they didn't have a way to process Haitian language. Um, and so that was our case study. It was Department of Defense, so I don't know if that was, you know, what exactly they were hoping to, you know, what they actually wanted to do, but anyhow, they funded this huge project. It lasted for five years, and I was involved a little bit in, with it in my lab, and I was sent to the final wrap-up, which was five years later. In the meantime, this kind of AI revolution had happened from kind of launched 2015, so these deep models had come out um, since the beginning of this project, and so they were kind of giving the overview of this project at the last wrap-up, and they started with these models, and oh, these deep learning, the neural networks have come up. We're gonna, they're going to work. They're going to be great, and they had uh, I guess the last update maybe they had all planned to use them and now it was a wrap-up meeting and they realized well it just don't work they need a lot of data uh, we don't have that so for some of the teams they have been allowed to use native speakers of the language to come and give them data and these were you know top computer scientists they were in industry um, and I remember there was one from Johns Hopkins one from Columbia University um, who stood up there and said we were using these native speakers to get the data, but we just feel like we didn't know how to do it. We didn't know how to get the information in an efficient way out of these these, speak these humans. Um, we feel like there's gotta be a better way to do this, but we don't know what it is. Um, and these were computer scientists. So I'm sitting there both shocked and not surprised at the same time because they're computer scientists, it's not a social science, but I'm sitting there as a linguist thinking there's a whole stack of literature in linguistics from people who have been working with uh, these understudied, under-documented languages for decades about how do you get the information, elicit the information you need for a specific goal and task um, from the human speakers. And also with that, how do you do this work and how do you interact with the speakers in a way that gives back to the community um, more than just paying them for the hourly work but actually gives benefit of your research to the community. And they didn't know about this. Um, so talking about jobs and how to address uh, the bias and, and the problems that come up with them, um, I think that social sciences and humanities have a lot to offer. And the computer scientists are starting to recognize that. Okay, so I think we are 7.05. So I think we need to wrap up. But I'm sure it's something we could all talk about for hours. I know we do in our house. <laughs> um, but I thought that to end it might be fun if for each panelist, and they don't know this is coming, um, but just off the top of your head for each of you, which gives Sid a direct advantage because he's going last, what, do, what are you most excited about, about the idea of chat GPT and higher education? And what is your biggest concern? I go first. I'm most interested in uh, the question you ask is, I'm excited about uh, coming up with unique ways to help students learn how to use this in a way that's going to make them stand out in their jobs and become better writers and better communicators um, and learning how to do that creatively in a way that, you know, discourages them. We're all lazy. We all need help. Um, but also encourages them and makes them more aware of what this can do for them. Um, 
my biggest concern is the the equity. Um, are we just going to build these models for English and just one way of speaking English, or are we going to be creative? Um, which also means actually we have to go back to some of the older, less less exciting for um, the technology because they're not state of the art models. Those work better for languages and weight in varieties of languages that um, ha we have less data for. Um, so are we going to just keep moving forward without considering everybody in our society, or are we going to take the time to pause and um, reach out hands, I guess, to help. David, biggest concern, most excitement. Having it write my emails, losing my, <laughs> losing my job. No, uh, more seriously, I, I mean, you know, Lean forward. everything she said, but also, I mean, one, one really exciting thing as a researcher is that um, we're starting to see more special purpose tools, like um, some people in public health at Stanford uh, trained it on a huge corpus of like public health papers. Um, and it was able to answer like questions about public health with a surprising sex success rate. Like not amazing, but it got something like 50% of the questions that you might ask uh, doctors right, um, which is like way above what you would expect from just someone randomly guessing. Um, so yeah, so like what would um, what would a system like that trained on like a huge number of papers in my discipline look like? Like there's a tremendous potential to really help us um, research much faster than we ever have before. I think that's really exciting. Um, but then, yeah, that really, I think the job loss worry is the, the big one. And that's, that's largely a policy problem. So how are we going to, as a society, set things up um, so that we get more of an equitable distribution of benefits from the technology? And you always have that issue whenever you have new technologies. But, yeah. Sid, most exciting and biggest concern? Oh, you're muted, Sid. Sorry. Um, I think that my biggest excitement is that because we're talking so much about these AI bots in terms of writing and communication, that we've really got an opportunity to disrupt what we've always assumed about writing and communication and really rethink that. Now, for those of us, for instance, in composition studies, you know, we've spent a lot of time thinking about the autonomous writer and the writing subject and how we teach writing. And this sort of opens up the, the, the question about how we teach writing in a kind of disruptive way that lets us not have to adhere to the traditions we thought were the foundations of communication. And to me, that sounds kind of exciting. Um, I think my biggest fear falls in line with the others, uh, concerns regarding equity, but also concerns regarding a new level of the digital divide and how exclusion is gonna take place with all of this. Um, and we're seeing the the politics of that play out in a lot of discussions already. And so I think that that to me is my biggest concern, particularly working with students um, at, at UF. Great. And I see Matt has a microphone in hand. So I assume you're gonna say something, but maybe you just hanging out with it. I don't know. No, uh, I was actually ready to hand off for questions because we lost some of our student assistants who had to go do some other things. So I, I I do have one thing to say. We do have some information back here on the back table as well about some uh, different AI initiatives and so on. So if you want to stop and, and browse back here and also the College of Arts and Sciences table back here as well. So thank, thank you, you very much everyone for coming. And also to our amazing panelists here is Sarah, David and Sid remotely. <laughs> And I'm sure that this will be the first of many of these types of panels and discussions and I think engaging in it and having fun with it because it's not going away. Thank you guys. Have a good night. <laughs>